Previously in chemistry, one of the theories that you've taken a look at um, as in regards to acids and bases was Arrhenius's acid-base theory. Originally, Arrhenius thought that acids were substances that ionized in water to form hydrogen ions, that's H+, while bases dissociated in water to form hydroxide ions, that's OH-. Generally, that meant that in their formula, in the formula of the compound, if it was going to be an acid, it had to have an H in it, and if it was going to be a base, it had to have an OH written right in the formula. However, as you studied, and as Arrhenius also figured out, not every acid has this H plus in its formula, not every base has its OH minus. Um, so therefore, Arrhenius went ahead and modified his own theory to say that acids are substances that now react with water to form hydronium ions, that's H3O plus. So that's what's formed when H plus ions react with water. Bases, according to his modified theory, are substances, yes, they could dissociate, like he said before, to form hydroxide, or they could also be substances that react with water to form those hydroxide ions. That was previously in previous episodes uh, of chemistry study on acids and bases. So let's take a look at this first equilibrium system here. Okay, this is um, this is a reaction showing uh, a bicarbonate, also called a hydrogen carbonate ion. Now it's this guy reacting with water to form an equilibrium system making H2CO3 and OH minus. Pardon my equilibrium arrows. We know that equilibrium arrows should look like this, but very hard to type. Uh, if anyone knows any ways to type those equilibrium arrows, hit me up with some ideas. In this reaction, we can see, okay, um, HCO3, which by the way, is part of baking soda. So baking soda is sodium bicarbonate. So that would be the ionic compound Na plus HCO3 minus, which would then dissociate in water to just take a look at um, getting that HCO3 minus, that bicarbonate ion reacting with the, that's what reacts with the water to form hydroxide. Arrhenius would have said, ooh, this reacts with water to form hydroxide. Okay, baking soda is a base, is what Arrhenius would have said. According to this reaction, looks like he was right. Let me tell you this, though. Oh, we already just said those things. I'm too fast for my computer. Imagine such a thing. Let's look at this reaction. Here we have same bicarbonate ion. If I'm in the lab and I'm careless and I accidentally spill a strong base, say it was sodium hydroxide, and I got these pretty harmful hydroxide ions floating around. One of the things that I could do to help neutralize that spill before I clean it up um, is I could add some baking soda to it. Again, those bicarbonate ions. And what would happen is the bicarbonate ions are going to react with the hydroxide to form water, okay, which would lower the pH. So say this spill of base had a pH of like 13-ish. I don't know. I'm just making this up. Because we're making products that are more neutral, um, we're going to see like this would have a much lower pH. Maybe let's say like the combo of these two products would have a pH of around 9. That would be definitely way more safe for me to touch before I had to clean it up. Now, lab safety aside, what's going on here? We just talked in number one about how bicarbonate was a base. It reacted with water, it formed hydroxide, that's a base. But in reaction two, as we go through and look at it, we see that the um, bicarbonate ion is actually lowering the pH of hydroxide, which that's what an acid would do. What's happening here? Is bicarbonate an acid or is it a base? And Arrhenius didn't have any answer for that. 
So along came these two other guys, Bronsted and Lowry, and they developed their concept of what is an acid and a base. Okay, let's take a look at that. That's where we kind of pick things up in uh, our development of, of acid-base theory. First and foremost, Bronsted-Lowry does not define a substance as specifically an acid or a base. It defines reaction entities based on how they behave. So that baking soda that you have sitting in your pantry right now, Bronsted-Lowry would tell you that's nothing. It's a box of baking soda sitting there. It's not until the baking soda takes part in a reaction that Bronsted and Lowry would be able to classify it as an acid or a base. That's the first part of their theory. Really unique. So what's an acid? According to Bronsted and Lowry, an acid is a substance that donates a proton. And what's a base? Well, a base is a substance that accepts a proton. What's a proton? How are we donating and accepting those things? Guys, a proton is just a fancy way of saying H+. Plus. That's our proton. Okay. Why is that a proton? Think about starting out studying chemistry where we're taking a look at subatomic particles, protons, neutrons, electrons. A hydrogen atom, atomic number one, means it has one proton in it and it has one electron. When hydrogen goes from an atom into an H plus ion, it loses that electron. Therefore, when we're talking H plus, the only subatomic particle that it has in it is a proton. Okay, so there's no electrons. Generally, no neutrons. Most hydrogen atoms don't have neutrons. Um, so that's why we say, when we say proton, we're talking H+. I'll go back and forth um, with how I refer to it. Sometimes I say H+, sometimes I say proton. You'll also have to be able to go back and forth as well and just understand all of that. Okay, that those two concepts are one and the same. So, Donates a proton, which means gives it away, accepts a proton, takes it in. Let's go back to our first equation here. If we compare what's going on between our reactants and our products, okay, we can see, okay, actually, HCO3 became H2CO3. How did it do that? It must have taken one of the H's from water, okay? And another way to say that it took an H from water would be to say that it accepted a proton from water. In this case, when we have HCO3 accepting a proton, we would call that a base, according to Bronson and Lowry, a substance that accepts a proton, which, Hold on to your seats, this is gonna blow your mind. Because the water was the one that donated that proton to HCO3, water's an acid. What? So we could take a look at, if we were talking about empirical definitions of acids, where we're like, oh, acids have a pH of below seven, um, Water doesn't have a pH of below 7. And that's okay. According to Bronsted and Lowry, we're not classifying acids bases based on their pH. We're classifying them based on what are they doing in the reaction. Here, water donates a proton, an H+. That makes it an acid. Who's accepting the proton? It's the HCO3. That makes it a base. Now, if we take a look at that second reaction that we talked about, we have HCO3 plus hydroxide, and it's making CO3 2 minus and H2O. So if we compare reactants to products, what does it look like has happened? Well, it looks like this little H from HCO3 took a journey over to OH. Okay, We could say 
HCO3 was the proton donor, and OH- was the proton acceptor. Okay? Or, make it even shorter, HCO3, because it's the proton donor, is an acid. And OH-, because it's the proton acceptor, is the base. That's what Bronsted and Lowry tell us with their concept. Now, there's a few more points to Bronsted and Lowry's ideas. Let's take a look at those. First of all, a chemical reaction must involve either both an acid and a base or neither. Neither is present. Let's take a look at that. If a proton has an, or sorry, wow, if a reaction has an acid in it, that means it has something donating a proton. But if there's no base present to accept the proton, where does it go? Okay, well, it doesn't. That's not a thing that happens. We have to have both an acid and a base present, or we're not dealing with an acid-base reaction, and that's okay, too. Not every reaction is an acid-base reaction. That's one main part, another, or I should say another main part of their theory. Then we take a look at this idea of amphiprotic. Amphiprotic, if we look at that word, it starts with that prefix amphi, okay? And to remember what that prefix means, I always think about amphibians. Remember back in like grade, I don't know, two, where you're learning about like classifying animals, reptiles, mammals, birds, amphibians, and fish? And one of the main characteristics of amphibians was that it lived, or that it, that they live in both water and on land. Well, that prefix amphi means both, okay? What are we talking about in this concept? Because it's not frogs, okay? It's not amphibians. An amphiprotic reaction entity has the ability to either donate or accept protons. It won't do both at the same time. Okay, make sure you know that. But depending on what the substance is reacting with, it could either donate a proton or it could accept a proton. And we've actually just seen that in the case of bicarbonate. We'll get back to that um, in just a moment. Hold on to your hats. Last concept is this idea of conjugate acid-base pairs. These are substances that have the same formula, okay, so same elements in it, only differing by a proton. And again, that proton is H+. Plus. So their formulas are going to be almost identical. The acid will have one more H than its conjugate base. Let's look back at these reactions again. So we already went through Right, and we already classified in this first reaction, this was the base, this was the acid. Well, let's take a look at what the pairs would be here. Okay, we can see that HCO3, the thing, that's probably not science enough, the product that likely came mostly from it was this H2CO3. That fan would be one, conjugate pair, where HCO3 is the base and H2CO3 is its conjugate acid. So bases have conjugate acids. That means the other two substances left, H2O and OH, they must be another conjugate pair. I'm going to shortcut that. Those are our conjugate pairs. Okay, so if water is the acid, then OH has to be its conjugate base. Okay, this seems like such a simple concept to me, but what do I know? Um, I see students mix it up all the time. So the way the pairs work, I can't stress this enough. Okay, is that the base has a conjugate acid and the acid has a conjugate base. Okay, this, I don't even want to write it. The acid and the conjugate acid are not a conjugate pair. Okay, 
the acid is a, in a pair with the conjugate base. Please make sure you get that in your notes. Start it, highlight it, whatever you need to do to make sure you draw your attention to it. Next reaction. Okay, we already got to the part where this was our base, this was our acid, and again trying to figure out, okay, what are the pairs here? Well, HCO3 gets together with CO3 2 minus, and if HCO3 was the acid, CO3 2 minus must be the conjugate base. And then OH and H2O. Hydroxide's the base, so water must be our conjugate acid. Okay. Let me break this down even further for you. When we look at an acid-base reaction, using the lens of bronsted lowrys um, ideas, we have an acid and a base as the reactants. For products, we have the conjugate acid and conjugate base. Okay, that's how these react. Or sorry, that's how these reactions work. Let's jump back to this idea of amphiprotic. We can see in reaction one, where bicarbonate acts as a base, that's different than in reaction two, where bicarbonate is acting as an acid. So bicarbonate, hydrogen carbonate ions, would be something that we could call amphiprotic. Sometimes it will react as a base and it will accept a proton. Sometimes it will react as an acid and it will donate a proton. Those are the ideas behind bronsted lowrys acid-base concept. What I would suggest now is that you pause this video, go through a bunch of examples where you're just looking at reactions, you're identifying what's the base, what's the acid, What's the conjugate acid? What's the conjugate base? Hey, can you find any amphiprotic reaction entities before you move on to the next part of this video? Here we have yet another data table um, to use in this course. This data table, it's spread out over two pages, and this was the best I could make it look. Okay, I know it's very small. You probably can't read anything right off the screen, but you also probably can find a better version of this to have in paper copy in front of your face. I just want to talk really quickly about how this table is set up. You can see in the first column here, also I should say that these two, that's terrible, these two are one table, um, but my version has them on two separate pages and so I kind of had to do a side by side. Okay, bear with me. You'll make it through. So this first column, look at this, I'll point out both to you, is the names. Okay, we have the common name, we have the name of the acid, and sometimes they offer you the name of the ion as well. You just have to double check and see if it's there. Okay, next column. These are all the acids. Ooh, I should like make sure that you guys know when I say these are all the acids, they're not all the acids in the world, but in this column is acids, okay? There might be some missing. There's a few missing. These are the common ones, okay? Third column, bases. Okay, so in fact, if we took a look comparing the acid column to the base column in this particular example. I don't even know if you guys can see it clearly, but first we have the acid and then next to it written, we actually have the conjugate base for that acid. Okay. And the way that this table is set up, so this would be, this part here would be like the top of the table. Okay. Versus down here, this is the bottom of the table. The way these acids are set up is in order of strength. So we start um, with our strongest acids uh, on the top on the left hand side, or in the left hand column, I guess, of the two formulas. We have six strong acids. 
They're all the acids that are above hydronium. Okay, that's hydronium there. When we have six strong acids present, really because what makes an acid strong is the fact that it reacts 100% with water to form hydronium. So when we're talking about six strong acids, um, we're just really any of those six. We're not talking about like specifically HNO3 or HCl, anything like that. We're talking about H3O, just straight up hydronium. Why? Because it reacts 100% with water in solution to form hydronium, which means no equilibrium system formed for strong acids. Um, and all we have present um, in the solution would be the hydronium ion and then whatever anion, which will all be spectators, by the way. Okay? That's our strong acids. But then when we take a look at our weak acid, acids, which start with oxalic acid there, Okay, they continue to be listed in order of strength. So here we would have our strongest acids. And then as we went down this acid column, both pages, we would end up with our weakest acid. Oh, it's water. That probably makes you feel a little bit better than earlier when I told you that water was an acid to begin with. Yeah, it's a very weak acid. That's how the acids are set up. Now, conversely, bases, if we look at our bases, hey, we've got hydroxide right here. That's the strongest base we're going to get. So the bases, the strongest base is in the bottom right. And then as you go up, um, the right-hand side of these base formulas, we land up here with our weakest base. And guess what? That's water too. Okay? Guys, this table is set up following the exact same ideas that a redox table is set up, except for instead of talking about oxidizing agents and reducing agents, we are talking about acids and bases. So that's how this table is set up. These numbers in our final column for Ka, okay, we will talk about in another lesson. So don't worry about them today. I may use them just for reference, um, but don't worry about what do those numbers actually mean just yet. You can see by looking at them that they do go from uh, biggest to smallest as they run down, and that may come in handy a little bit later on. So let's take a look then at these acid-base reactions according to Bronsted and Lowry. How can we predict acid-base reactions? Well, it should greatly excite you that we are going to use another five-step method. And I know some of you guys might be looking. These are all the steps here. I've only written four because I took the by hard, I mean time consuming, so don't worry too much about that. First things first, stop me if this sounds familiar. We want to list all entities present. This little table here will tell you what you have present. So, for example, you have to remember when we have ionic compounds, they dissociate into cation and anion in solution. When we have the next one's ionic oxides. I honestly don't think you're going to see too much of that. Um, strong acids, they're going to uh, react 100% with water. So all we're going to have is the hydronium ion and then the, con the conjugate base, which will be a spectator. But let's have good form and list it anyways, I guess. Weak acids, okay, because weak acids uh, ionize in water less than 50%, we're going to keep them all together. Okay, We're not going to be talking about hydronium present. We're just going to write the weak acid and also weak base, Okay, those bottom two rows. Uh, those formulas just stay all together. So when you're listing your entities present, you have to make sure that you know um, is something going to dissociate. Is it going to 
react 100% with water, strong acid, to form hydronium? Or is this a weak acid or weak base, um, in which case I just keep the formula as is? Also remember, when we're talking acid-base reactions, they happen in solution, which means water is always present. Once you've listed all your entities, you can use your data table that we just talked about to determine what's the strongest acid, so highest up in the left column. And what's the strongest base, lowest down in the right column? Then, step three, once you know your strongest acid, strongest base, you're going to write a reaction that shows the transfer of one proton from the strongest acid to the strongest base. Draw your arrow, and then you get the conjugate acid and conjugate base as your products. And lastly, we want to predict the position of equilibrium okay and we're going to use this generalization right here what is this showing if the strongest acid is higher up in the left hand column then uh, and it's above where the strongest base is in the right hand column this reaction proceeds the forward reaction proceeds greater than 50 percent which also means products are favored Let's see. So products favored, or you could say the forward reaction is favored. If um, the strongest acid is found in the left-hand column below where the strongest base is found in the right-hand column, then the forward reaction proceeds um, less than 50%. Okay. What does that mean? It means reactants are favored, and it means the reverse reaction slash reactant side are favored. Okay, same generalization or same idea, same visual as we used in redox when we were taking a look at if a reaction was going to be spontaneous or non-spontaneous. Let's go through some examples here. First up, what is the predominant reaction if spilled drain cleaner, which is predominantly sodium hydroxide, is neutralized with vinegar? Are reactants or products favored in this reaction? So step one, let's list all of our entities present. We have sodium hydroxide, which would dissociate into sodium ions and hydroxide ions. Then we have vinegar, and it's important to know that vinegar is a solution of acetic acid. Acetic acid, which is a weak acid, okay, so its formula would stay intact, CH3COOH. And then, because we've got all these aqueous solutions, we have water present. What I want you to do right now, pause this video, use your data table to find what's the strongest acid, what's the strongest base we have present from this list. Hydroxide, strongest base. It's found right at the, the very bottom on the right-hand side, OH minus. And acetic acid is our strongest acid. Uh, it is found with a Ka value of 1.8 times 10 to the negative 5. Again, I know you don't really know what those numbers mean probably, but I'm just using it as a reference. So I don't have to be like, oh, two-thirds down. Okay. 1.8 times 10 to the negative 5, there's your acetic acid. Water also appears as an acid or a base, but it is definitely weaker than either hydroxide as a base or acetic acid as an acid. So we have found what's going to be reacting, okay? Acetic acid. plus hydroxide, so there's our acid plus our base, 
Then products. So what's going to happen here? What's going to happen is this little H at the end of acetic acid is going to go and be donated to hydroxide. That's what acids do. They donate protons. So that H gets donated to hydroxide. So now you have to think, okay, well, what is going to be formed? Well, if CH3COOH um, is losing a hydrogen, it's going to become CH3COO minus. Just remember that every time you take a hydrogen away, it's not just the hydrogen, okay, it's H plus. So you're also taking a one plus charge away. Similarly, when we are adding an H, it's not just the H on its own, it also comes with a positive one charge. So your um, whatever the base is, is going to increase in charge by one. So OH minus to accept a hydrogen is going to form water, okay? OH plus another H plus is going to make two hydrogens, one oxygen. We call that H2O, that's water. Those are your products. So again, classifying acid base. Conjugate base, okay? Remember the conjugate base is part of a pair with the acid. And then water, conjugate acid, that's part of a pair, I guess I'll just go up here, with the base. I've deliberately left my arrows till the end. Gang, what we see here is OH minus, which is not just the strongest base we have here, it is also a strong base. There's only one strong base, it's hydroxide, okay? Whenever you have either a strong base or a strong acid reacting, we're actually not forming an equilibrium system. We are forming, we are having a quantitative reaction. Therefore, we use our quantitative arrow. Remember, that's an arrow like you see in literally every other chemical reaction except equilibrium systems that shows that this reaction proceeds in one direction only. Okay, so quantitative arrows only when you have strong acids, strong bases. Everything else will be equilibrium. Okay, that's this example. Next up, one last one to go through here. Hydrofluoric acid and an aqueous solution of sodium sulfate are mixed. Cool, let's go through. Step one, list our entities. Hydrofluoric acid, let's check on the data table. Oh, it's not one of the six strong acids, therefore we're not, it's not going to form hydronium and then F minus. So we just keep that whole for formula together. It's HF. Okay, and an aqueous solution of sodium sulfate are mixed. Recognizing that sodium sulfate is an ionic compound, that means in water, when it's in a solution, it's going to dissociate into sodium ions and sulfate ions. And then lastly, because these reactions are in solution, we're going to have um, water present. Pause, figure out your strongest acid, strongest base. Okay, strongest acid, hydrofluoric acid. Um, it is at 6.3 times 10 to the negative 4. And then strongest base is this sulfate ion. Um, it's at 1.0 times 10 to the negative 2. Hot tip, if you guys have study flags, you can use them on this data table to flag your strongest acid, strongest base, so you don't have to find them, lose them, find them again maybe lose them again, find them a last time. Okay, so you can go ahead and flag them. That just makes things a little bit easier, working smarter, not harder. Then let's write our reaction. HF, so our acid plus our base, SO4 
to minus, okay? This time, we have a weak acid and a weak base reacting. So this will be an equilibrium system. Let's show this H from HF being donated to SO4 2 minus. So when the hydrogen H plus leaves hydrofluoric acid, you're left with just the fluoride ion F minus. Okay, and when SO4 2 minus gains an H plus, you get HSO4 minus. Identifying everything. Just as practice, acid plus base. This is my conjugate base. Remember, that's what pairs with the acid. This is my conjugate acid, which is what pairs with the base. There we have it. Quick summary ideas of um, Bronsted Lowry's concept and how we use that information to predict acid base reactions. Um, remember, now we're talking about acids and bases in terms of how do they behave in a reaction. So do, do they, does a substance donate a proton, in which case it's an acid? Does it accept a proton, in which case it's a base? We talked about conjugate pairs, how acids uh, pair with their conjugate base and bases pair with their conjugate acid. And we talked about amphiprotic substances. And then you used all of that knowledge as well as our acid-base strength table, um, data table, to find um, out how to predict acid-base reactions, which it just dawns on me. I did not put my percentage. So anytime we have equilibrium arrows, tisk tisk me, um, we need to say, okay, how, uh, what's the extent of this for a reaction? So here, again, our strongest acid, HF, is below our strongest base, which means that this reaction will happen, the forward reaction will happen, less than 50%. Just wanted to see if you guys are paying attention. I didn't forget that at all. Okay, get lots of practice in. Um, solidify these concepts in your brains. Please make sure you're asking questions if you have them.